Hey everyone. Um, we are here to talk about our February reading re recap. Bidi bop boop, a favorite is bop boop. We read some books. Okay. Um, Intro. All right. So I already did the first half of my February. Um, so this is the second half. And we're going to alternate and go back and forth. <laughs> Because um, Sir Chonk read some books and he wants to talk about his books as well. I didn't read very many books. Right. So I did finish The Stand as promised. I know I said in my last one I was in the process of reading it. And so I did end up finishing it. This was one of the ones Sir Chonk gave me um, for our year-long like swap. You loved it. No, I, loved I, it. Did, I didn't like it. She didn't love it as much as she could have. Yeah, I didn't really like it at all. Um... For, on a personal level, I kind of hated it. Um, yeah. That being said, like, I can appreciate why people like it. And so I would say for me, it was like a one to two star read. But I ended up giving it, I think, two and a half because I was like, well, I can see why people like it. It's still too damn long. And the reason it's too long is not because, like... For the first half of the book, I was like, there's a lot here, and I don't like a lot of these characters, but the character development is good. And so, like, it didn't feel like anything was unnecessary. Um, the problem is, the parts I liked the most were, like, the stuff about, like, the virus and as it was being spread and how, like, you know, like, New York was empty because there were no people. And, like, some of those things were really cool. Um... And I like the things that, like, it le lends itself to. Because, obviously, like, I like The Walking Dead. And, um, you know, obviously, there's, like, you can see where sort of this inspired a whole kind of genre. Um, but I didn't like a lot of the characters, like I said. I pretty much like Starkey. And then, you know, he's not around that long in the context of the book. There are a couple other. I liked, um, what did I say his name was? I forgot his name already. Glenn, shoes. Glenn uh. the sort of like philosopher guy I liked him and the other characters were like partly okay some of them were partly okay but then also kind of not and then like the female characters were just ridiculous they were all like just there was one cool female character the other ones were I mean, clearly written by a man is what I'm going to say. I mean, they basically talked about, like, how they wanted to have sex or have babies. like And pillow fights, I hope. Yeah, I don't know too many women who think the way the female characters in this book thought. And I was like, this is why you can tell how men men really just cannot well, write how females Daniel think. Daniel Steele writes some of the most ridiculously empty-headed doofus girls as well. Let's not, uh... Okay, but... Really they were, ex head. yeah, but like all they cared about was like having sex with people. That's the dream. And also, every character is so unbelievably attractive. Look, obviously, Stephen King was a little bit horned up when you wrote this. Book. Yeah. Give the man a break. And then the second half of this book, so there's like three parts of this book. Part one is the virus. Part two is apparently the town meeting segment. And that was too long. Oh. Like, I was like, this really could have been an email, Stephen. <laughs> because... This review is too long. I mean, it was just... There were a lot of town meetings. And I gotta tell you, you know what I'm not interested in? The nuances and intricacies of town meetings. I feel like this was while he was a journalist. And he was just like, oh, I have to cover this town meeting. Can I use this in my writing? And then the last half was the sort of stand between good and evil and like the biggest thing that disappointed me with this book the thing i like liked the least about this book is that the villain is so embarrassingly boring like this is supposed to be the king of horror he's supposed to be like the master of horror writing and then like everyone's talking about how this guy's in their dreams and he's so scary and we see him do literally nothing and the whole final stand is, like, resolved really quickly in a dumb way that he has nothing to do with. And I don't know. I was just really disappointed in the villain. Well, the ending does suck. And the, and the villain is sort of, like, generic, bland evil. Right, which yeah. is, like, not interesting. And I don't even mind that he's, like, 
pure evil. Like, I don't mind a villain that's just evil, like, a. So, just Game of Thrones. No, I was gonna say Sauron. All right. Um, if there's, like, some, like, if it's creepy or there's a reason to be afraid of it, but, like, I mean, Sauron's not really that interesting either, but, um, the Nazgul are kind of cool anyway. They're kind of not cool. Yeah. So anyway, so that was my feelings on that. Um, Sir Chunk did, in the time it took me to read The Stand, it took him as long to read Love and Delighted. So. Oh, God. So this is yet another book I was forced to read by this human over here. And there's not enough gelato in this book. <laughs> if it was just like me eating gelato near a book, this would have been great. But instead, it's just like a bunch of like incredibly like lucky derp wagons talking about how sucky their lives are. It's like, oh no, I have to go and live in Italy for free. Oh, and all these really attractive boys want me. What a nightmare. Oh no, my mom died of cancer. They don't, that doesn't even, it's not even a factor. It's just a plot point. I know. Like she doesn't even care about it. It's like, oh yeah, I should be telling my mom. Anyway, so now let's learn about my mom's past, but never actually give a crap that she's dead, really. I mean, it's like, that's just a plot point to get her to, to prance around Italy and hang out with sexy boys. It's so stupid. This is pure garbage. The whole book is it's about garbage. how sad she is no, about her mom. No, it's not. It's it like, really is. That's like the sort of like generic statement that's what it's supposed to be about, but it's not that about that at all. It's about her just hanging out in Italy, which, like, look, if you want to read a derpy romance about people hanging out in Italy, then this is for you. Yeah, and I did. And I don't. <laughs> so, I liked this. I thought it was really cute. Yeah, it's dumb. It's cute. All and right. It's cute. It's dumb. Anyway, so the next one I read was The Bullet That Missed, which is the third uh, Thursday Murder Club, and you know, it's funny because I have had this for a while and I haven't got, hadn't gotten around to it. Um, and I was like, the first like 20 pages or so, I was like, oh, maybe I'm over this. Um, because like it was a shift, obviously, from like what I'd been reading. But then as I got into it, I was like, nope, I'm not over it. I love it. And I absolutely adored it. Like the characters are so, I just love them. And the mystery is fine. Like, the mystery, I kind of forgot some of the time that there was even a mystery going on in this book. Because the characters were just so appealing and interesting that I was just, like, having fun reading the characters. So, I don't know, like, mystery-wise... I mean, if you're reading these for the mystery, you're going to be... Like, I don't know that the mystery is, is that good anymore. It's just kind of a thing that's there. But if you're reading them for the characters, they just get more and more charming and more and more endearing as the stories continue. And we get introduced to new endearing characters. And yeah, I loved it. I just love these characters. Um, Sir Chong's next book was Rabbit Run. Oh, yeah. So Rabbit Run. Uh, I've been wanting to read one of these rabbit-based Updike books for a while because, you know, they're like all these lists of best books ever. And so I started reading it, um, and the first, like, 20% or so is amazing. It's mostly, like, one long take about this guy who's just, like, had it with his life, and he just, like, says, screw it, I'm out of here. Uh, not for any, like, good reason or anything, he's just kind of like a whiny bitch. Uh, but it's really fascinating and interesting, and then they end the one long take, and he's like, well, maybe I'll go back to my wife. And then the rest of the book is this guy basically just being a complete self-centered jerk, which, like, is kind of okay, but then, I don't know, the story doesn't really hold up very well, doesn't interest me very much. Most of the other characters are not much in terms of, like, detail. Um, so, yeah, it's it's fairly well written, and it starts out great, but then it sort of, like, falls apart. And I don't, I don't, I guess it's kind of a, um, sort of the stream of consciousness, first person writing, I guess, wasn't that big at the time, so it's mildly bro uh, groundbreaking in that way. But in terms of an enjoyable read after the first 20% or so, it ain't it. Um, Alright, so the next two I'm going to talk about were books that Sir Chunk bought me for Christmas. Christmas! Um, the first one is The Spare Room by Andrea Bartz. I absolutely so hated this. Room. This book was nonsense. Glad um, I bought it. Yeah, well, it's not your fault. I asked for it, but I liked some of her other books, and this one, I don't even know. Like, honestly, if I had if I had really actually read the premise, I just kind of was like, oh, I liked her other books, and I kind of skimmed the premise. 
But basically, it's about this girl, and I don't know, during COVID, and she's, like, leaving her boyfriend or whatever, and then she goes and finds, like, her old high school friend, and then she ends up in a throuple with her high school friend and her husband, and then, like, there might be, like, a murder, but also, it's literally just, like, pointless sex. And so is the spare room referring to someone's butt? No. Oh. It's the room she stays in well, with this throuple. Well, it seems like it's kind of full. And honestly, everybody fair. in this book was irritating. I didn't like anyone in it. And the unnecessary sex was just stupid. And, yeah, I hated this book. Um, the next one I, I had asked for was Good Bad Girl. This is Alicini. This one was pretty good. Um, was it also pretty bad? <laughs> no. It wasn't my favorite Alice Feeney, but it was solid. Um, I mean, she's done really. I just really like her writing. Um, the one thing I liked, I did. I guess I didn't like, is it wasn't as twisty as her normal books. Um, but it was kind of good for, like, a different kind of type of book by her. Um, and as always, like, I just think her... She has a really good ability to kind of tell, like, twisty mystery thrillers but also have a lot of heart to them so there's a lot of strong like relationship stuff family stuff um and I think she does a really good job of being able to balance those things which can be very hard to pull off where like it's an intriguing mystery but you're also kind of emotionally interested in the characters as well um so Sir Chunk you read a Christmas book too oh yeah so I finally read Holly I had to read the previous Holly S. Burt book before I got to this one, and it was not worth it. <laughs> First of all, as I think has been made clear many times, I despise the character of Holly, so I knew the chances of me liking this book were pretty low. But also hurting it was the fact that everyone in the book is a complete moron. Like, the killers only kill people they know, and they kill them all in, like, the same area. And it's, like, the most obvious situation. It's, like, how did the cops not find these idiots in, like, two days? But, no, they can't find them for, like, years. But don't worry, Holly will do it. Because she's, you know, all-powerful, can do anything. Um, and now, to add to the things, like, Holly's not quite good enough, let's also make her filthy rich. Yay. Great. Great. This is abysmal. I wanted to punch this book. I hope it dies a slow, burning death. <laughs> I really need to read some of this Holly stuff because, like, I liked her in the show, and I'm just curious my feelings on this. The problem is, as I realized after reading The Stand, is I'm not sure I like Stephen King that much. Like, I love The Shining, and I love The Pet Cemetery, but, yeah, like... Yeah, if you just read the ones from the 80s, you're good. A lot of his stuff I don't like. It's too long, and I also... He's... I know he doesn't think he is, but he's pretty racist. Yeah, he's pretty consistently racist throughout his books. But, like, it's not, like, mega obvious racism. But there's definitely a consistent under, like, lying moments where it's, like, this is clearly a dude who's a really rich white guy who doesn't understand much of anything about anything, but he's trying to, and it comes off really wrong. Yeah, which <laughs> makes me kind of question how I would feel about a female neurodivergent character. Yeah. She, because those aren't really, like, things he's... He hasn't really shown to be good at either of those. Yeah, and the problem with this character is, like, she has these, you know, these challenges to deal with, except she doesn't. She just says that she has them, but they never actually come up in the story. Except when she goes, oh, I have this challenge that I'm overcoming by having it not actually be a challenge ever. It's 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 awful. The character is complete unsolvable. People love this character. I do not understand how. It's a nightmare crap character. I know a lot of you like her, so you can tell I us why. I don't know how. Tell me why. What about her is interesting? She's like a super overpowered, unrealistic Mary Sue who pretends to have... Well, okay, she doesn't pretend, um, but he writes her as if she has these difficulties that she doesn't actually have. It's terrible. I think that's a problem I have with a lot of thrillers is like, They'll be like, oh, this person is, has PTSD when it's convenient to the plot. And yeah. then we forget this person like, has she PTSD. She has extreme social anxiety. But she, like, goes to people's houses she doesn't know, bangs on their door and demands they answer questions. Like, who with extreme social anxiety is going to do this on a regular basis? I do not understand. <laughs> All right. So the next thing I read was um, Black Book, which was James Patterson with David Ellis. So basically, David Ellis wrote it, and James Patterson put his name on like he does. Um, 
which is, you know, I'm not, I'm not even criticizing, like, he's honest about it, and he has helped, like, a lot of writers, like, break out because of that, so, you know, whatever, I mean, you can't, it doesn't hurt to have, like, one of the biggest selling names on a book as a, as a newer writer, so, it's even um, better than a blurb. Right. His name's Harrison Tez. I kind of wrote this, sort of. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think he basically gives, like, the writer some, like, ideas or, like, helps them fine-tune their ideas, and that's pretty much his involvement in it. But anyway, um, this book was fine. Like, it was, if you like sort of, like, procedural, like, cop books, it was a good procedural cop book. It had a couple twists. It was it was interesting. The thing is, like, it's not generally the type of book I like. And so I was like, yeah, this is pretty good, but it's not really my thing. And so I read it because I love La Closer so much. And I was just like, I want more David Ellis. Um, and I have his, the arc of his new book. So I'm really excited because I think, like, you know, I'm guessing Look Closer was kind of like his transitional book as he moves away from sort of that court and cop procedural type of thing. So, and I loved that. So I'm kind of hoping he, he was moving away from that because that's just not my, my thing. But I did love Look Closer. I then also started to read Divine Rivals, <laughs> um, which everyone loves. And I have to be honest, like, the writing was good. And, like, there wasn't anything bad about it, but I just stopped at, like, 20%. And I didn't, I wouldn't say I DNF this. I think I was just, like, maybe I'll come back to this another time because I just couldn't care. Um, and it's not like anything wrong with the book. It was just because it's like a fantasy world and I just wasn't feeling it. And like, it takes a lot for me to like care a lot of the time about fantasy. Um, just simply because it's, it's not really my favorite genre. So in this case, I was just kind of like, uh, like this is well written, but I just am not in the mood um, so I'll probably come back to it. It was on my February TBR, so I, that's why I mentioned it, because I did try, and then I just realized it was like, I was, I was just not in the place that I want to read this. So I'll probably come back and try to read it again at some point when I'm more in, like, a fantasy mood. We'll see. Um, maybe next month, maybe later this year, maybe in a few years. I don't know. Um, but like I said, there wasn't anything bad. It just wasn't for me. Um, for now. And then Sir Chonk, you read Ray Bradbury? Oh, yeah. Uh, apples, right? Golden apples of the So, uh, this is called an older Bradbury collection. I think it's one of his first couple of Bradbury collections. It's got a few staples in there. Um, and, yeah, it's really good. Uh, of course, not all of them are going to be perfect because he tends to have this thing where he's like, I'm going to, like, delve deep into the emotional nostalgia, which I like, but, like, if you do it too many times in, in the, these really short stories, it's like, I can't keep digging deep for six pages and pop it out and going back down again, Ray. Um, but they're still really good. Um, I love the first one was about a sad dinosaur hitting on a lighthouse. It's very sad, but very good. That's probably my favorite. And, of course, there's a couple of uh, favorite ones, like Golden Kite Silver Wind is in there. Um, oh, what is it? There's, like, two other mega-famous ones. I'm drawing a blank about which ones they are. Sound of Thunder? Oh, yeah, Sound of Thunder's in there. That, of course, is a time travel kind of butter, yeah, being a butterfly wing story, kind yeah. of thing. That was great. Um, yeah, awesome. It's Bradbury. I love Bradbury. All right. So, Chonk is sick. That's why he's so mumbly. You're mumbly. Okay. Um, then I read Alice Feeney's I Know Who You Are, which was kind of awkward to read so quickly after Good Bad Girl because it's very, very similar like, the plot is similar, there's, like, literally, like, names are similar, similar, like, things happen, um, and at one point I was kind of, like, the characters even have, like, I'm, like, starting to wonder if Alice Feeney was, like, kidnapped as a child or had a child kidnapped because, like, it was two books about the same thing, very, very similar, and so it's kind of interesting to see, like, one of her early books and then a few years later, a new one that's kind of like similar theme um, because obviously Good Bad Girl, I think, was better written. Um, but I liked I liked parts of this. Um, I think, like, overall it was okay. It just, yeah, it had some, like, weird... There were some weird elements that were just not 
well handled, um, which is not really like her, but again, it, you can tell it's like her early writing. So, I mean, it was still well written, but I think if you're going to read Alicini, I would start with some of her earlier stuff, you know, and expect that it's not as good as her newer stuff. Um, and then I read uh, T. Kingfisher's Thornhedge, um, which I also got for Christmas, and this one was Pretty. fine. Um, what I think I don't really like, I the don't, hedges. no, I don't really like oh. retellings very much. And so this is a retelling of Sleeping Beauty and it's cute and it's fine. But like, I feel like it doesn't have, it didn't have like her pizzazz that I get out of her like originals. And so, um, I mean, I'll continue reading, like, I'm going to try to read everything she's written because I do like her writing, but, um, I definitely think I'm, you know, I'm not going to like her fairy tale retellings as much as her originals. Um, I can't so, wait for her to retell Brambley Hedge. The one with the hedgehog? Yes. The British the thing? The Adventures of Hedgehogs. Yeah, well, anyway, so, um, really pretty cover. Very short book. It's only like 110 pages. So, I mean, you know, the thing about T. Kingfisher is even if I'm like, eh, on her books, they're really short. So, I'm going to probably read them all. Um, all right. Sir Chong read another Endless Quest. Which one's this one? Claw the Dragon. Oh, uh, yeah, Claw the Dragon. This was kind of fun. There weren't as many dragons in it as I would hope um, for a Claw the Dragon book. There are dragons near the end, like the last 15% or so. But it's pretty standard choose-your-own-adventure goofiness. You run around, you see what's the worst thing you can do to yourselves, and then see how they're going to kill you off. And then eventually you go hang out with some dragons. It's fun. It's mostly for kids. I don't give a crap. I still like them. Claw. All right, uh, and then I read Secluded Cabin Sleep Six by Lisa Unger. Um, Did I buy that for like three years ago? Yeah, you bought it for me many years ago. And what I've realized is I don't actually like Lisa Unger, but I've bought a bunch of her books. Great. Um, and every single one I've read, I've been like, eh. So I think I'm done. Um, I mean, I obviously I'll read the ones I have because I have them, but I don't think I'm going to like pursue other books by her. And yeah. it's not... Did you say that you're... Ungerwhelmed? Yeah. Well, I want to say, Hello. one thing I'll say about her is that, like, they're not offensive. Where, like, I mean, I have been reading, like, thrillers that I'm like, wow, this person just, like, does no research and doesn't care if, like, they're, like, horribly offensive to, like, entire groups of people. So, like, I don't think she does anything like that. I just think they're, like, meh, like, in terms of, like, the writing. Like, they're very... One of the things I felt like with this book is, like, it was a good concept. It just felt like a rough draft. And it was so messy that I was just like, wait, what? And then, like, things didn't make any sense. And then I felt like there were things that should have been fixed that, like, nobody ever edited or fixed things. Um, and I was like, this is kind of weird for, like, a final draft of a book. Un Under-edited. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... The other thing about her writing, and this has been consistent with my experiences with her books, and again, like, I don't hate her books, I just don't really like them, um, they all feel like YA, and what I don't really understand is, like, there's nothing wrong with writing YA, and, like, a lot of YA thrillers are, like, bad, and so, like, I feel like this would be a better YA thriller than a lot of the YA out there, but, like, by making it adults, it just feels sort of odd because the characters feel very young and very immature. And then I'm supposed to believe they're like in their 30s. And I'm like, yeah, but they seem like they're 15. So I don't understand why we wouldn't just make it about, thir you know, teenagers or at the very least like 20 year olds. So I don't know. I don't really understand why you would write teenage tech type characters and then make them adults. Um, and this is a common thing. I see this a lot. Um, and I don't know, maybe it has to do with, like, you know, their agent and who's like, oh, it'll be easier for me to sell this if it's, like, a 25-year-old. Um, I don't know. we will never understand why yeah. this. Although, I would think, like, YA is easier to publish in because, like, I don't know. But Unger. anyway. Anyway, that's that. Uh, Sir Chunk read some uh, Shakespeare, so... What's this one? Oh, well oh, oh boy. Oh, oh, folks. What a weird title for this play. So, All's Well That Ends Well implies that everything works out, and I guess it kind of does. But the main thing here is there's this girl, and she likes this dude, but this dude's, like, 
uh, very high in society. But he agrees to the marriage anyway for, like, to unify, like, some, I forget why, some political fluggly boo or whatever. Um, and then, but then he's like, actually, no, you kind of suck. I don't like you. She's like, but I love you. And he's like, nah, I'm out. And he, like, takes off. And then sort of she wants to, like, you know, find a way to reconnect with him. But he's not interested at all. He kind of hates her. And also he's like, you're beneath me. Because, you know, he's he's a rich prince guy. And she's like still has some money, but she's beneath him socially. So he's like, she sucks. So she does what any young woman in love would do. She pays someone to hit on the prince and convince the guy to want to sleep with this girl that he that hits on him. And then when she lures him to the bedroom with the lights off, they switch places and he tricks her into having sex with the girl that he originally had kind of married. So, yeah, all's well that ends well, I guess. <laughs> At the end, the guy's like, wait, what happened? Ah, uh, forget it. I guess I guess I'll just marry you. And so it, it's pretty messed up, to be honest. That's very odd. <laughs> yeah, Shakespeare. And then your other Shakespeare. Oh, Anthony and Cleopatra. So in this one, Anthony's wife dies, and then they get him to try to marry somebody else to smooth over some political stuff. But he's like, but actually, this Cleopatra lady, she's smoking hot. I'm a bang her. And then there's this war. But then they're like, actually, let's not have a war anymore. Let's all be friends. Like, yeah, we're all going to be friends. But then one of the triumvirate guys, Octavius, is like, ha ha, or I'll just go to war anyway. And then he does it anyway. And then people have arguments. And then it's Shakespeare. So at the end, everyone commits suicide at the end. Well, this is the difference between his tragedies and his comedies. Right. In the comedy, you, I don't know, it's not quite rape, but it's (laughs) like the cousin to rape. Uh, And then this one, that's just everyone commits suicide. Yeah. I loved Antony and Cleopatra. This was one of the first ones I read of his. Yeah, I read I this like before it. It is uh, good. Romeo like, I really like Antony a lot. He's interesting. Yeah. Um, Cleopatra, so I feel like, is kind of gets the shaft in terms of a character. She's more just like... She's, like, only mildly schemy. I thought she was going to be much more scheming. She's more just like, I sure do wish I could have sex more. I'm like, all right. <laughs> I think I like this better than Caesar, though. They're pretty close. Antony's in both. So yeah, I like I both. All right, so I read three more books. I read Legends and Lattes, uh, which Sir Chunk also bought me for Christmas. Pretty bad. Um, I liked this. It was cute. Um, it's, I mean, it's cozy uh, fantasy. The thing is, like, I guess there's a prequel, which was the bookshops and Bone Dust, I guess. Um, I don't feel any need to, like, read a prequel. You I don't... were able to understand it without any else extra help? Yeah. I'm going to keep doing this. I don't need a prequel. I don't need a sequel. It was fine as it was. How about like, a squeakquel? It was a cute story. You need a squeakquel? Um, no. Oh. Um, I did like but I liked it. I mean, it was just really, <sighs> it was a nice, light, fun um, read. I liked the just, I mean, basically, if you're a huge fantasy reader you may not like this because there's not a lot of things going on. It's literally just about an orc who decides to give up, like, fighting and open a coffee shop. Um, And so it's about her opening the coffee shop, the people who work at the coffee shop, and then the different types of coffee and the pastries they make. And then eventually there's, like, some plotting of, like, you know, some evil elf, and there's some stuff that goes on with that. And then they rebuild the coffee shop, and that's that. And that's, like, the story. Yay. So if you, like, want a lot of action, you're not going to get it. But if you like just, like, coffee and fantasy stuff, it kind of reminds me, like, when I used to play, like, a lot of video games, like like Dragon Age and Skyrim and stuff, I really enjoy a lot of the time. Like, I'll spend, just, and, like, Witcher, I'll spend, like, hours just walking around the towns. Because I just like checking out the towns. Because I'm like, I wish more of these buildings were available. I wonder what goes on in this house. And like, so it's kind of like being able to sort of see the story of like an NPC in a video game. Like, what actually goes on behind the scenes in that, you know, shop that you go to to buy like potions? Or... How long will they hold that amulet aloft if you leave them there? <laughs> arm extended. If you come back in eight years, will they still be holding it aloft? <laughs> yes. Right. So it's, I mean, I don't know. I thought it was really cute. I'm not sure I'm going to go like read more of the series. I don't know if I want to read a prequel just because like No prequels. I already read like this one, so I already know how kind of how what happens. 
so there's not like a lot of stakes. I mean, there's no stakes to begin with. It's, it's about, you know, making coffee. Um, but I did enjoy it. Um, the next thing I read was Heaven by Miko Kawakami, maybe. Um, so I've been, I read, I haven't read a ton of Japanese literature. Um, I had read Battle Royal like years ago. And then over the summer last year, I read Confessions. Um, and then somebody had like really disliked this that I had seen. You know, they were like, oh, this book is the worst book I've ever read. Um, and so what's kind of funny is I tend to find when people like hate books, often that's how I like find books I love. Um, which is why I'm always like, I don't think it's like the worst thing if you dislike a book. I mean, you know, so I may like something that you don't like, or you may like something I don't like, but sometimes like people not liking a book actually interest me more than when they like gush about how great a book is. Um, because usually when someone's like, this is the worst thing, I'm always like, what? What's, I'm curious. Um, I didn't hate this book at all. I thought it was really good. Um, and one of the complaints that I had seen, and I've seen on a few of the reviews of this, is that they felt that the, the bullying was over the top and the characters were too philosophical and the way they interacted and the way they talked and the way they thought. But like, I didn't find that at all. And like, I found this book like, this book was really hard for me to read because I related a lot to, like, a lot of what the characters went through. Um, and, I mean, it says they're in middle school, and I wonder if that maybe, like, confuses people because they're 14. So it's middle school in Japan, but, I mean, it would be, like, early high school here. Or, I mean, I guess technically it could be 8th grade, but I think it would be, like, ninth grade. Um so I related to a lot of it. I had similar experiences, you know, when I was growing up, like I was definitely like had to deal with a lot of bullying and like a lot of horrible things. And, um, and so one of the things I thought was odd is like, oh, these characters act too old for their age. But I know I have like literally had conversations very similar to the conversations the kids in the book had when I was like 14 and 15. So I don't know. I mean, I think that's just, like, depends on the person. And I don't know, maybe, like, a lot of, like, trauma, like, makes you older, like, the way you think. I, I don't know. Or, you know, I think they're both kind of, like, the, the main kids are both sort of loners. And so they spend a lot of time reading and a lot of time, like, alone. And maybe that just makes them more, like, introspective um, for their age. But... I think the other thing, too, is that what I found with Japanese literature is it's very, um, it tends to be very sparse, and then, like, really dark, horrible things happen, and it's, it's described in a kind of cold way, um, which may be a translation thing, it may just be, like, the way the literature is written, um, so it's just, like, a really short book, but, it, like, it packs a lot of, like, really dark, intense things in there, um, there, the final events of the book are really, really dark. Um, so very, very, like, appalling kind of stuff that happens. Um, but I, I really enjoyed this. I thought it was very well written. And it, like, emotionally, like, had a lot of impact on me. So, um, yeah, it's a different perspective if, you know, um, like somebody who did like it. Um, and then the last book I read for the month, um, I really loved. I think this was my first, my favorite book of the month, um, or at least the favorite book out of this section, because um, I think my favorite book was If We Were Villains. Um, this was Remarkably Bright Creatures, and this is a story where, like, literally nothing happens, so if you're looking for, like, a very plot-heavy book, you are not going to enjoy this. Like, it's just basically about this woman who's older and 30 years ago her son died um and she never really found out like what happened and she's kind of like still dealing with like that tragedy and her husband has died now and so she's just kind of living this like quiet lonely life and she works at night cleaning um in a local aquarium and then there's another guy who's in his 30s, early 30s, and he's, um, or just about 30, and he's just kind of a mess. Uh, he doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. He's just all over the place. And then the third narrator, there's a couple of, like, side narrations, but the third narrator is 
um, a giant Pacific octopus who is in one of the containers Ooh. at the <laughs> at the um, aquarium. And I mean, I'm gonna be honest, like an octopus. Yes, an octopus. Yes, excellent. <laughs> Um, so the octopus character is fantastic. Of course. Um, he's snarky. And, and handsome. Yes. <laughs> Dapper, if you will. Sir Chong no. has a... Hat. As a, we have an octopus squishmallow. And he's called the fancy octopus squishmallow. He's very fancy. So this is Sir Chong having a conversation with the octopus right now. Good day. Anyway, so, um, the, <laughs> I realize I tilted the mic to the, to octopus, the octopus, not to you. Yes. <laughs> so, Thank you for interviewing the octopus. <laughs> well, anyway, the octopus character is really fun. Um, like I said, he's snarky. Um, the characters are just, I mean, a lot of people apparently find, like, the guy, the 30-year-old guy, like, really, like, horrible. I thought he was good. I thought he was a really authentic character. I mean, he was lost and confused and didn't know what he wanted to do with his life. And he's a mess and he's kind of miserable. And, like, I don't know, I just thought that was kind of, like, made sense. And so the characters here, we have essentially, including the octopus, mm. we have sort of these antisocial characters who are lonely but also, like, not necessarily, like, good with people. Um, and I just found them very authentic and very real, and, um, I mean, I think that's the hard thing with, like, literary fiction is, like, yes, there is, like, the, I guess you have, like, the shtick here with, like, the octopus narrator, which, you know, may appeal to people because they're, like, ooh, something different, but, I mean, it's still literary fiction, so, like, it's just basically about people's feelings and lives. And if that's not your thing, you're probably not going to like it, no matter how much the octopus narrates. Um, but if you like literary fiction and you like character studies that are, like, you know, kind of slow and just authentic looks at, you know, slice of life, then you'll probably like it. Um, but I really loved it. I thought it was really well written. I thought the characters were really just appealing and realistic. Um, yeah, so I recommend it. But again, you know to people who like literary fiction and contemporary general fiction. And octopi. Yeah, but again, if you're looking for, like, an octopus, like, a lot of octopus stuff, or you're looking for, like, a lot of action or interesting things to happen, that's not the kind of book it is. It's just about some lonely people in a small town in Washington. And, like, it kind of hints that there's a mystery, but, like, it's really not a mystery, and it's more, like, just about how their lives are connected so do not go into this thinking you're getting like a thriller or a mystery or anything just slice of life character the octopus is the killer no oh. he's not oh the octopus is so much fun have you murdered people no there's no octopus murders mm, at least that's what he wants you to believe the octopus doesn't kill anyone the he just octopuses around ah, you have been tricked He's really funny, though, because he's boy. constantly trying to get out of his container, you know, being an octopus. Anyway, yeah. he's really fun. I loved him as a character, but I also like the other characters. So, yeah, that's February. Sir Chonk, what are your thoughts on your March plans? I will read probably nothing. He's reading The Shard by Brett Easton Ellis. So let's see if by the end of March... It's, like, really long and kind of awful so far. There's an absurd amount of sex in it, and I don't like reading about sex. <laughs> yeah, me neither. So, I mean, I've already read a few things for March, um, but we'll see. We'll see how Sir Chunk does with March, and, um, yeah, we'll be back with some other nonsense. Maybe. Boop. Booptopus. Unger. Booptopus. What? Boop? Bye. <laughs>